I'm Mark Krieger, president of the American Heart Association. And with me is Donald Lloyd-Jones from Northwestern University and Sid Smith from the University of North Carolina. We're in Chicago at the ACC meeting. This morning we heard a late-breaking clinical trial on HOPE-3, the Heart Outcomes Prevention Evaluation Study. HOPE-3 looked at the effect of blood pressure lowering medication with candesartan, 16 milligrams daily, plus hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams daily, as well as rosuvastatin, 10 milligrams daily, in a population of individuals at intermediate risk for cardiovascular events. Uh, this was a very novel trial, novel design, uh, in a two-by-two two factorial manner. And I'd like first to talk about the cholesterol-lowering arm of the HOPE-3 trial and turn to you, Don, and give us your impressions. Well, thanks, Mark. You know, I think this is a really important, uh, important study for us to, to take apart in detail. First of all, as you pointed out, these were men over 55 and women over 60 who were at risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, there wasn't a specific LDL level or a specific blood pressure level for any of the arms of this trial that was required. And in fact, they got fairly average values of both of those things at baseline. Um, the study was carried out, I think, really in an exemplary fashion um, with very, very high rates of follow-up. So I think we can have good confidence in the results. Turning to the cholesterol arm of the study, as you pointed out, uh, that involved 10 milligrams of rosuvastatin versus a placebo. And what they found was a reduction in the LDL cholesterol of about 35 um, milligrams per deciliter, about what we would expect for a moderate intensity statin. Um, and in that setting, they saw a 25% reduction in the rates of uh, cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. So really right on the line of what we would expect for modern intensity statin in terms of the risk reduction. So really probably not too many surprises, but what I think is important to understand is yet one more trial showing us that in a pure primary prevention population, um, at risk but not particularly high risk, uh, if you look at the, the predicted risk of these individuals, you know, it's somewhere in the 75 to 10% range for most of them, a little bit higher for the men. Um, but it really, I think, brings home the, the point that statins work for primary prevention. Even moderate intensity statins are a very good buy for primary prevention. And I think that the, the threshold defined by the 2013 AHA ACC cholesterol guidelines at 7.5% is where we should start to consider therapy for primary prevention really holds up well in the light of this trial. All right, so the findings clearly reinforce the guideline recommendations from 2013. I think very clearly, and even expanded a little bit because this was such a pragmatic trial, they didn't actually base it on risk or LDL or blood pressure. These were just people at risk from a broad population across the globe. All right. So, Sid, so let's turn to the blood pressure lowering trial. Can you tell us about that one? Yeah, well, and again, let, let's reinforce the population. These are men over the age of 55, women over the age of 60 with at least one additional risk factor. And importantly, none of these patients are from the United States. This is an international study, 25% from China, 25% from South Asia, South America well represented. This is the data. These are the data we need outside of a large evidence base in the United States upon which to make international recommendations. So I'm particularly happy about that. And also the fact that we're beginning to look at risk as a target, not an LDL level or a blood pressure level. Two important concepts. When it comes to blood pressure, interesting findings. A mean pressure in the group around 138, reduced on, by candesartan therapy and hydrochlorothiazide therapy jointly, six millimeters, uh, but no benefit overall for the group. However, looking more, more specifically in a pre-specified tertile uh, type analysis, the higher blood pressure group, whose blood pressures are over 143 systole, up to 154 or so, did experience a benefit, whereas no benefit seen in the middle tertile, and actually the lower group showing an increase in advance from therapy. So we have the suggestion of a J-shaped curve. Again, we have to remember the risk of this group is intermediate. Sprint maybe had a slightly higher risk. We have to be careful about how we extend these observations broadly to populations. What we do know is that this particular group at moderate risk did have a benefit from lowering blood pressures that were over 143 systolic by roughly six millimeters uh, uh, mercury. We also heard uh, a presentation this morning comparing 
the, all the therapies, the lipid lowering therapy and the blood pressure lowering therapy versus placebo. And the findings from that were favorable. They met the primary endpoint. So that begs the question, should we be administering a polypill to, the, to our patients who are at intermediate risk? Yeah, I think it's an important question. And you know, if, if you tease these apart, as you're saying, this was a multifactorial design. So you got um, either double placebo, or you got just the rosuvastatin, or you got uh, just the, the blood pressure lowering agents um, at one at a time, or you got both. And comparing the, the both versus the double placebo, as you said, um, significant benefit and reduction, but all that benefit came through the statin. Um, and, and as Sid pointed out, the, the only sort of benefit was, that was coming from the blood pressure lowering therapy uh, was in those with the higher blood pressure. So, you know, for the polypill story, the ideal had been, well, we're just going to say we should treat all men over 50, all women over 60. We don't need to worry about measuring blood pressure. We don't need to worry about measuring cholesterol. I think it's gotten a little bit more complicated um, because maybe we do need to know their blood pressure before we put them on a polypill that contains a blood pressure lowering agent as to whether we can expect benefit or potentially some harm. Well, I would agree, Don. I think the, the problem is the, the heterogeneity of, of effect here. We have a standard strong effect from statin therapy, but a variable effect from treating blood pressure. And to try to combine these into one pill for primary prevention, I think, might be a tricky strategy. Secondary prevention, different story. But we're talking about primary prevention. I think what we're seeing is identify the risk uh, and treat with statins, and you're, we're going to see some results at about a moderate level of risk. So I like the poly pill, but I, particularly in countries with developing economies, different healthcare systems, not sure we know exactly what the ingredient should be when it comes to blood pressure plus uh, statins. And I think the point was made this morning that there, there may not be one poly pill for all, right? That right. it might look a little bit different for our diabetic population, it might look a little different for our just hypertensive population. But probably all the polypills should have a statin in there. Absolutely. And, I, and we're at a point where we do have generic medications and we can do it. Right. But not a one size fits all. Right. We still have to take the patient's characteristics into consideration. Uh, even if we give a polypill, whether they need additional mm -hmm. antihypertensive therapy on top of a statin. Yep. All right. Very interesting study. Moved the field forward, certainly. And I know all of us will be taking this into consideration uh, as we address our patients who we encounter and cer certainly as we develop guideline recommendations in the future.